Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Aquino. Well, we've entered into the second 50 days of President Trump's leadership over the United States of America. And who would have thought it would have created such a furor in the relationship between the United States and Hawaii, of all places? We, you'd think we'd be concerned more about the relationship between D.C. and China, Beijing, and so forth. But in our media, at least here in Hawaii, we're looking quite a bit at the impact of the Trump presidency on this, the 50th state. But is there a special impact or a disparate impact upon the 50th state? Or is it just incidental? I've got someone who can answer that question and delve into some of the things that have taken place from Washington, D.C. He's the director of the Grassroot um, Action Hawaii, or Grassroot Hawaii Action, which is our partner organization working on Washington, D.C. issues on behalf of the state of Hawaii. And I uh, welcome him to our program today, Andy Blom. Andy, welcome from the cold, cold East Coast. Has your weather gotten any warmer in the last few weeks? Aloha. Actually, this is the first day of spring, and it crept up to 60 degrees. And you notice that I'm trying to bring on weather by wearing my Hawaiian shirt while you look like you're from Washington, D.C. We've got our roles mixed up here. We've got a symbiotic relationship. So what is Washington, D.C. saying about Hawaii and its reaction to the Trump presidency so far? Frankly, not as much as... Hawaii is saying about Washington, D.C. Uh, Hawaii has not been singled out for anything. There's certainly dissatisfaction with uh, Judge Watson and your Attorney General Ching, Chin, but it, in, nothing that's happening has been directed at Hawaii. These are cuts that are a, you know, an example or a definition of how President Trump thinks the country needs to go and he's you know he doesn't go oh this will hurt north dakota or this will hurt hawaii or this will help florida he's working on a national level so there's less import upon the nation uh of Ho from hawaii's reaction to president trump's policy so far than we like to think perhaps uh let me let, let me go straight to what you mentioned uh, attorney general doug chin we're dealing here now with the president's immigration policy, which in some ways isn't as different from the, his predecessor's policy as some would like to think. But let's start off by defining it. What exactly is Hawaii reacting to in terms of President Trump's immigration policy? Well, it's a little hard to understand in some ways because this policy in general is popular. And what Hawaii is reacting to is the same seven nations that President Obama restricted immigration from, Trump was restricting immigration. His second executive order allows people with valid visas and valid green cards immediate access, but puts a much, much stronger vetting process in and puts a stay on immigration from seven, well, six now nations that have severe terrorist ties. And this is part of his America first, let's protect America, let's take the steps. But this is not a giant leap from anything President Obama did. Now, Attorney General Doug Chin sued the president, and uh, Derek Watson, the federal judge, uh, granted an injunction uh, to stop nationwide, or globally actually, the, the implementation of Trump's policy. Uh, what do you think about, what do people in D.C. think about that? Frankly, I, I hate to say this, as a Hawaiian, this hurts me. They think they're being silly. It's hurting, it is hurting Hawaii's image in this way. There's so much coverage about the first suit and so much coverage about the fact that Trump, Trump's attorney general presented strong constitutional arguments that the Ninth Circuit Court didn't listen to. They revised the executive order specifically to the complaints that were brought up in the lawsuit. And in spite of the fact that it was revised exactly to those complaints, it was immediately challenged and immediately stopped by the judge. And the attitude up here, for the most part, is these guys are just showing off. They're dumb. Why are they causing the problem? Now, this has raised a renewed discussion of the value of the Ninth Circuit as it is currently composed. Why don't you bring us up to date a bit about that discussion? 
Well, there, there was a story today, actually, that five of the justices on the yes. Ninth Circuit, because they did not do this on bond, said that uh, the Trump's second order met constitutional muster. So even within the Ninth Circuit, they're recognizing this. The Ninth Circuit is overturned more than any other uh, circuit court. They're overturned 70% of the time when they go to the Supreme Court, which is just, frankly, ridiculous. But now there's legislation in Congress to break the Ninth Circuit into two separate courts, just to break them up because of the succession of bad decisions. That raises but, the whole question of politicization uh, of the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and this may be a little tabloidish, but uh, w what are the thoughts about the, the fact that uh, President Obama here in Hawaii had visited with Judge Wastson the day before he issued his ruling. Uh, that could be coincidental. Uh, what are people saying about that? Uh, President Obama is drawing a lot of very unfavorable comparison to the way George W. Bush handled transition and courtesy to his successor. And there, and actions like no one knows or can prove that President Obama influenced that decision, but the coincidence is very strong and it creates a very bad taste in people's mouth that he's out here tinkering and they feel that the role of an ex-president is certainly to give the, you know, to give the new president the chance to prove himself, to exercise uh, you know his vision and to bring in his cabinet to take you know to take command uh, as the president and there's questions being raised up here about the propriety of what Mr. Obama did on the whole well, this is beginning to hurt Obama's reputation it's beginning to hurt the Democrats up here because one of the things this election showed was how dissatisfied people in the middle were from the behavior in Washington. And Mr. Trump's approval ratings go up a point or two every week. So, frankly, there's two things. It's not very courteous, but it's also not working. Well, about a week after Attorney General Doug Chin and went to court and uh, then when uh, Judge uh, Watson issued his ruling, President Trump I issued his skinny budget with massive budget cuts <laughs> uh, for all states uh, uh, across the nation. But there has been some conjecture here in Hawaii, and I don't know if it takes place anywhere else, that there was a bit of retaliation here on the part of the administration uh, against Hawaii for its position it, it took it, uh, in the court. And uh, would you simply validate that or put that to rest? Uh, well, first of all, these cuts go absolutely across the entire nation. So, you know, whatever Hawaii is experiencing, North Dakota is experiencing, Florida is experiencing, California is experiencing, all the states, and it was the majority of them that went for Mr. Trump, they're all experiencing it. There's no Hawaii... Again, I fight for this here, and I try to make Hawaii visible as much as possible, but Hawaii is not important enough to be singled out in a federal budget that way. And more than that, the budget is a reflection of Ms. what Mr. Trump feels his mandate was and what he's promised to do, and that is to dramatically downsize government, to deregulate the yeah, you know, the mess in Washington to begin to cut the thousands of regulations that tie individuals' hands, that ties companies' hands, that ties, you know, ties up everybody now. One of the first things that's happened is it cutting the waters of the United States uh, regulations that President Obama put in. This is a very good thing for Hawaii because what it did was give the government the right to come in and tell anybody who had any water on their land what they could do with their land. You're talking about the Clean Water Act, which Clean Water Act, yes, which the president actually uh, has uh, repealed. That is to the U.S., but uh, now 
that's been you know repealed by President Trump. This is a very good thing for Hawaii. So we should be cheering for the things he, President Trump has done for Hawaii. But you you just deflated my sense of self-importance or Hawaii's sense of self-importance by saying that we're not actually being singled out by the Trump administration and there's no retaliation for the behavior of Hawaii, but that this budget is part of a rational plan that actually in and of itself had nothing to do with Hawaii but has to do with uh, a program, an agenda of the Trump administration. That's what you're saying. Exactly, and, and, you know, and uh, what the State Department by 29 percent was not directed at Hawaii. Cutting the EPA by 30 percent was not directed at Hawaii. Raising the defense budget by 7 percent is a good thing for us. That's right, it, it is. And, then that, and usually, uh, raising the defense budget is something that Hawaii's politicians and media give high praise to. But in this case, uh, w what we're seeing in our local newspapers and what we're hearing from our local politicians is how terrible it is that social services are being cut, that education is being cut, that uh, public programs such as PBS broadcasting, as well as uh, soft diplomacy such as the East-West Center are being cut. Uh, in fact, uh, that news takes about three-quarters of all the news but very little news is given to, or attention is given to the fact that maybe we'll be able to protect ourselves from being blown out of the water by North Korea. Yeah, so you, you're you not that far. You're now within ballistic missile range of a genuine lunatic who executed someone with an anti-aircraft gun. This is an unbalanced person with nuclear weapons. I would love to see a much more developed missile defense system in Hawaii. I think it would be great for everyone. I think more military jobs, and not only more, but one of the things that this is going to do, because Pacific is so strategically important, because China is misbehaving, North Korea is, excuse me, North Korea is misbehaving, one of the things that this budget is going to do is see that the military presence in Hawaii not only is expanded, but is solidified so we're not going to be on the list of base closings, and we're not going to be losing a really key component of our economy. That's right. Well, we'll come back after a short break, and I'll ask you a little bit more about the positive impact of President Trump's policies upon Hawaii. Uh, everybody, you're watching Andy Blom, our executive director of the Grassroots Action up in Washington, D.C., our sister organization. I'm Kaylee Akina with the Grassroot Institute here in Hawaii, and we'll be right back on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako after this short break. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. I'm the host of Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. It's a program where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. So join us every other Tuesday from 4 o'clock to 4.30. We're live in the studio on working together in ThinkTech Hawaii. Take care, see you soon. Bye. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We highlight businesses and individuals that are successful in Hawaii, and we learn their secrets to their success. I hope you can join us and listen in, because we always have a pack of information on successful stories in Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back from Halftime. Uh, this is Kelee Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. At the Grassroot Institute, we think it's better to work together rather than apart to build a better economy, government, and society. So Thanks very much to Think Tech Hawaii, a great broadcast network led by Jay Fidel and a terrific team producing at least 30 hours of original content broadcast from Honolulu all across the nation and the world. We're talking with Anderson Blom, or Andy, in Washington, D.C., who heads our organization up there for grassroots, uh, working on issues such as the Jones Act, uh, federal recognition of Native Hawaiians, uh, and a good number of other things that have to deal with just making whole, the United States uh, and Hawaii work together in the best way possible. Andy, we were talking a bit about President Trump's uh, 
f second 50 days as we begin to assess its in his impact upon the state of Hawaii. Uh, several negative comments have been made in our media and the press with regard uh, to immigration policy uh, as well as to federal budget cuts. But you also see some advantages in terms specifically of the realignment of the budget around its priorities. So what are those priorities and, and how do they benefit uh, Hawaii? Well, the priorities, and let me start with Ehana Kako, because one of the big problems that's going on is exactly what you're describing, which is hysteria on the left and hysteria on the right, but we appear to have lost the ability to stop and look at anything objectively or, most importantly, to work together. And it's really important we begin to come together. We have a nominee for the Supreme Court who everybody in the Judiciary Committee, when they appointed him to the Circuit Court, every Democrat spoke wonderfully highly of them, and now we're going to have endless attacks on, you know, why can't we move past the partisanship and look at what's actually happened. What's actually happening is President Trump really believes that the federal government has gotten out of hand. It's gotten away from the people, it's not responsible to the people, and that it's spending a great deal of our money on things that we don't have a say in and wouldn't choose to spend our money that way. I have actually a couple of hundred nieces and nephews in Hawaii and they all work very hard for every dollar and so there's hysteria that President Trump has cut the endowment for the arts but I really don't think any of those nieces and nephews and I certainly don't want to give a dollar of my tax money to people who are putting a crucifix of Jesus in a jar of urine or who are putting a, a painting of the Blessed Mother with dung thrown on it you know so when Trump begins to take these actions, he's responding to a large voice of helplessness from average Americans who say, we're tired of Washington deciding how we have to think, deciding where our money goes, deciding <clears throat> that we don't matter. And when we get out to Hawaii, yes, he's cut the National Endowment for the Arts. For centuries, art was supplied, you know, Artists were funded by patrons and by selling their work. The government didn't support the, you know, didn't pick winners and losers in the arts. The government, why is the government, why are we in Hawaii paying for a radio or television network? We're not paying for CBS or Fox or, well, probably country music television is not a big deal in Hawaii, but, you know, why does one network get subsidized by your tax dollars. This is a rational cut. You were talking in the first segment about the purposes of President Trump's budget values. In particular, one is his desire to, quote, deconstruct the administrative state, end quote, which refers to the fact that we've seen a phenomenal transference of power from the states up to the administration of the federal government and uh, nowhere is that more evident than in the sprawling regulations of regulatory agencies that take federal laws and then just proliferate uh, subsidiary laws, uh, one in being the Clean Water Act. Uh, would you explain how the repeal of the Clean Water Act, or Waters of the United States as it's affectionately called, helps to dismantle the administrative state and return power back to the state itself and to its own counties? and to the people and it's ultimately it's, this, this is a, a very a excellent example because what it did is an example of just how broad these regulations are written and how much power they give the government and you vote for people to go up to Washington to pass laws these are all all of the deconstructing the administrative state are not laws passed by your congress people and your senators they are laws invented by people in federal agencies so some bureaucrat decides we're going to have a new law in the waters of the United States, which means any piece of property that has standing or running water on it has to have approval of the Environmental Protection Agency before anything can be done on that property. Now what that means is if you collect a lot of standing water when it rains, 
you can't build a shed in your backyard without the EPA approving it. But that's the extent to which this overreach has gotten. It's extent to it, and it's not an extreme example. You have a stream running through, and you want to divert a little to irrigate the, uh, you know, well, I happen to like my guava tree, but, you know, okay, there's, you can't do that without EPA approval. Well, now you can because President Trump has killed that regulation. But I, there are regulations upon regulations upon regulations right. that make us responsible to the government on things that should just belong to us or to the state. You know, keeping uh, keep going with your example of the Clean Water Act, uh, it's no secret that we've had a real struggle here in Hawaii to grow the agricultural industry. In fact, this last last year, we saw the shuttering of Hawaii cane and sh Maui cane and sugar, Hawaii cane and sugar on Maui, the last of the cane uh, plantations, and and that affected about seventy plus percent of all the agricultural land on Maui. Now, I went on tour of that land and saw with my own eyes that uh, virtually every uh, uh, several yards you have a re an irrigation system, an irrigation ditch built into th that land. And right now, the plan to try to convert that land to diversified agriculture or other uses is, is facing all kinds of struggles not the least of which had been litigation because of the Clean Water Act. And so uh, here we see how something President Trump has done actually re-empowers Hawaii to make its own decisions about it, its own land and use it as is needed. And that's a, that's a very important distinction as well. It, it affects individuals and their property, but also the land and water in Wisconsin is not like the land and water in Hawaii. And these are decisions that need to be made at home. The Hawaii is a very unique and special place. It does not need to have to live by regulations that are passed to work in North Dakota or Florida. Well, Andy, so, the one of the administrative state is deconstructed. That's right. We control what happens in Hawaii. That's right. Well, Andy, one of the reasons that you're sitting there in D.C. is because we sent you up to to work on one of the issues that is close to the heart of grassroots, and that is the repe repealing, modifying, or whatever you do, exempting ourselves from a 1920s shipping law called the Jones Act. And I don't want to take precious time to go into detail about that, but many of our viewers understand what the Jones Act is, and if there's any question, for those of you watching, just go to our website, grassrootinstitute.org, that's grassroot institute.org and uh, search for Jones Act, you'll find a complete library of articles describing what that is. Suffice it to say, that shipping law and set of laws from the 1920s has resulted in the raising of prices here in the state of Hawaii. And uh, what I wanted to ask you, Andy, is now into the second 50 days of the Trump administration, do you see any new pathways for bringing about some kind of reform or updating of the Jones Act, something we've been working for for quite a while? Well, not in the next 50 days, unfortunately, because, frankly, things are crazy up here. There's new executive orders every day, and there's new, you know, and there's some real big-ticket items like the Health Care Act that have Congress completely taken up. However, we now have a Republican Senate and a Republican House, which dramatically increases our opportunity to get Jones Act reform passed. And I think that we have, as the year weighs on and we get into this more seriously, we already have some legislators who are very interested in advancing the legislation and we're going to have a much better chance of creating a good Jones Act reform for Hawaii. There's a coin toss, frankly, with President Trump, and that is that he wants to buy American and build American, and that makes it difficult to reform the shipbuild part of the Jones Act, but he is very, very concerned over and over and over again about the individual Americans, uh, individual Americans being able to not just exist but to prosper, to make their lives better economically with tax cuts, with 
programs that gets the government out of their hair with lower rates. So we just don't know yet whether he's going to see the Jones Act as a regulation that's got to go, that's 100 years old and burdens the people of Hawaii, or is he going to be hard-nosed about, yes, but we have to build American ships. Not well, going yes. About it, this. It'll be important it, for reformers like yourself uh, and the rest of us at Grassroots Institute to be able to show that an appropriate reform of the Jones Act, even if it does touch the U.S. build requirement, will actually build our economy, will actually re result in more jobs, will actually strengthen the nation. And beyond that, President Trump's commitment to the building of the United States military, including the United States Navy, will add more than enough jobs to the and build our military shipbuilding industry. Exactly, and that's a, the fact that I think he wants to go from 180 to 300 or 350 ships. Those shipyards are not going to be turning out any Jones Act ships in the near future. They're going to be very busy and expanding, which helps our argument, frankly. And your, your point is very valid that to the extent that he sees that this helps American jobs, helps American economy, and helps the people of Hawaii, you know, I think we have an excellent chance, but it's, you know, we're taking a different path than we would with a different president. But the, the you know, the opportunity is better than it's been in, in eight years. Well, very good. Well, Andy, I want to thank you very much for representing the grassroots movement in Washington, D.C., taking our needs and values and making them known to l legislators, congressmen, senators, and others. And, uh, Thank you for wearing an Aloha shirt today. <laughs> it's a great thrill to wear an Aloha shirt. I just wish I had, if you could send some sunshine through the Skype here, I'd really appreciate it. Very good. Well, thank you very much. My guest today, Anderson Blom, Executive Director of Grassroot Hawaii Action, sister organization of the Grassroot Institute. Signing off, I'm Kili'i Akina. Until next time on Ehana Kako on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network, Aloha.